Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Evelyn Mosley. I am the owner of Eudaimonia Chiropractic in Algonada, California. Eudaimonia is a chiropractic practice that is all about doing things a little bit differently and sharing the true power and potential of chiropractic and living a chiropractic lifestyle. So we are going to go through a talk today, Chiropractic 101, that will help you understand what chiropractic really is about and how it benefits the masses more than you might think it is about. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I will be sharing the screen because I've put together a presentation for you. And I hope that you learn some new great things today that help you personally, that help a loved one, or that just help you understand some deeper knowing about a profession that has been around a long time, but is quite misunderstood. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, great. So a lot of people have heard about chiropractic and this is a blessing and a curse in some ways. One way is that chiropractic has a reputation, which is great. When you say that you are a chiropractor, people know what that is. <laughs> On the downside, that can be problematic because people have misconceptions about chiropractic and they think that they know what it is or they've had one experience with it, but they don't get the full scope of what it is and what it is that chiropractors are trying to do. So common misconceptions about chiropractic is that it's for people who are hurt or have pain. And though chiropractic does help a lot with people who are hurt or have pain, that is not really what it was ever designed to do. Um, chiropractic is only for people with problems. Um, chiropractic does help people with problems, but again, it is not necessarily designed and optimally used for helping people with problems. Um, it's quackery. I love that word. It's so funny. Um, there, you know, there was a time when chiropractic was first coming out where it was this really new idea. And, um, you know, the people who were developing chiropractic were very, very enthusiastic and excited about it. But it was not proven by time or by the scientific method at first. And, you know, people were very skeptical of it in the beginning, rightly so. Now that it has been over a hundred years of chiropractic being a profession, we have the science to back up what it is that we're doing. And we have the science to explain how it helps people. So quackery is out, sorry. <laughs> um, that it's similar to massage therapy. Um, we do touch people, it is manual. Well, most chiropractors touch people, not all. We, are you know using the body and addressing the musculos musculoskeletal system so it is similar in that way but chiropractors go to four years of doctorate program in order to become doctors of chiropractic after they get their bachelor's degrees and so it is a doctorate program and we learn about pathology, we learn about biochemistry, we learn <laughs> all of the anatomy and physiology, we learn about neuroscience. Um, we learn a whole lot more than just uh, the muscles and how, you know, how to use them to help people. So it's, it's very different than massage therapy in that way. And another common misconception is that it's really dangerous and rough. And that is not always true. Just like there's many different types of doctors in the world that use different techniques um, doesn't mean that all chiropractors are the same. So just as an MD is a surgeon or one is a, you know, doing research in a lab, <laughs> they still have the same degree, but they are practicing very differently. And chiropractic is the same way. 
Um, so please keep an open mind. One thing that's great about chiropractic is it is a technology that has been around for a hundred years now. We have learned a lot about how it works and we're going back to the beginning of, wow, this thing that we already know works and is safe and effective for humans has so much more potential than we thought. It's almost like if you found out that, you know, that when doctors found out that baby aspirin was good for maintaining heart health in people that had had heart um, disease previously. It's like they didn't have to develop something completely new to help people with their heart disease. They had baby aspirin already. And so they put it to a new and better use. And that is really what chiropractic is on the brink of right now. Very exciting stuff. Okay, so to really understand chiropractic as a profession and as a whole, you have to understand its origins because it's not necessarily that chiropractic is starting something new. It is actually going back to the basics right now, at least the way that I practice. And it all started with a question. And the question was, why? The developer of chiropractic was asking, why? Why do two people who go through the same circumstances have different outcomes? Why do two people get the same virus and one dies and the other lives? Why do two people go through the same accident and one dies and the other lives? Why do two people have the same life event, like the death of their mother or their partner, and one is completely traumatized and the other is fine. He wanted to know the difference in what makes um, people resilient and what makes other people less resilient. So that question led to another question, which is, well, what is it that animates the living world? What is it that makes us alive? And these were very, you know, deep questions of our the developer of chiropractic. He wanted to know what controls everything in our body that we don't have to think about controlling. He was talking about our digestive system and our breathing and our growth and development. I mean, really, whose hand is turning the tide, what kind of energy, what kind of force are, is at play in creating all of this life? You know, how does an organism know? How does an embryo know what to build layer after layer? It's very interesting. So that led him to the question, the common denominator was our nervous system. Because D.D. Palmer, the developer of chiropractic, he knew that the nervous system was what controlled everything in the human body. So our nervous system is responsible for not only what we feel um, and, our, and our senses, which we all learn about, but it's also controlling all of that stuff, like our respiration, our digestion, our blood flow and circulation, our immune system. It's actually controlling what hormones get released and when. It's controlling our growth and development when we are in uh, utero. And it controls the way we perceive the world, et cetera, et cetera. So he was thinking, okay, Whatever energy and force this is, it's working through the nervous system, right? And that includes our brain and our central nervous system. Here in the image, you can see it includes our brain and spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system, or PNS, includes all of the peripheral nerves that go to all of our organs and extremities. Right. Very cool. So then his next question was, well, what would cause this system to be optimal? What can we do about it? What, why in some people doesn't it work as well? Um, and so 
he looked to the anatomy from the beginning. He got to the nervous system by looking at the anatomy. He looked around there. What he saw was, okay, our spinal cord is surrounded by our spine. <laughs> and all of these little vertebrae are, you know, are there protecting our spinal cord and our nerves have to exit our spinal cord through the joints in our spine. So what does this mean for us? What could this possibly indicate? So you can see here in this image, this is an MRI image of all of the little vertebrae here. Boom, 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 boom. The discs in between, which is this part here. And then this is the spinal cord coming through. Here's the brain, the cerebellum, the pons, the midbrain, all here. And then as you see the other side, the spinous processes here, um, which are these pointy parts <laughs> right here in the back. And then this is all musculature and uh, fat and tissue. Okay, cool. So his question was, what's missing? What, are these people deficient in something that's making them be less resilient? Do they need to eat more nutrients and greens? Do they need more... Um, do they need more what? Do they need more medicines? Do they need more calcium? He really didn't know what was missing. And then he came up with this, nothing extra, just no interference. So he started looking at innate creatures, creatures other than humans. And he thought about how much they know without having, you know, normalized thoughts and he thought about he looked at infants and he looked at children and he saw that you know we are actually mostly born knowing how to do everything to take care of our <laughs> bodies we're born we we breathe we're born we're digesting we're born our blood is flowing our heart is pumping we're born we've already developed and grown so much <clears throat> so he realized that it's not about what it needs, like a vitamin or a nutrient or something extra. It's just about what it doesn't need, okay? So this was really interesting. He's not trying to sell snake oils. He's actually thinking, what is blocking this system from working? when we know that innately and inherently it works in everyone, okay? So then he coined these causes of interference, subluxation. So a subluxation is really an adaptation to the different stressors of our environment um, that can become a tension pattern within your physical tissues and may lead to fixation or lack of movement, interference in nervous system signals, and therefore lead to dysfunction in the body. And subluxations can occur in any tissue, not just the joints, but it started in the spine because this was the place that's most closely related to the nervous system. It wraps tightly around the spinal cord, okay? So this is what chiropractic profession is based on the detection and correction of subluxations. No other profession in the world addresses this. No one else is looking for this when they are checking you. They might look for places that don't move as, as well. They might look for these fixations. They might look for the dysfunction, but they're not looking for the tension pattern that causes all of that, okay? So that is one way that chiropractic is really different, which is very interesting. Okay, so you might think, what causes subluxations? You have this brand new baby that, you know, has done nothing, has had no, you know, toxin, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
They're fresh as a daisy. Okay, say you're right, Dr. Evelyn, and we are inherently able, inherently healthy, and we're born innately capable, and we're born with this innate intelligence that knows what to do. Well, then what the heck happens if we're so intelligent? Like, what happens? So there's the three T's, traumas, toxins, and thoughts. Okay. These are the three things that cause subluxations. And remember, subluxations are those things that we cannot adapt to right away that lead to tension patterns that manifest in our physical tissues. So we'll go over each one of these one by one. Okay. Trauma. Trauma is like a system overload we clearly have too much force, you know, physical forces like Newton's law of physics um, that are coming into our body that are too much for our body to handle physically, okay? Emotional trauma falls under this too, but it is more, it kind of tarries between the thoughts and uh, traumas section um, we know that emotions are highly, highly connected with our nervous system and that we actually have receptors for emotional molecules in our spinal cord. So it's not just in our brain, but throughout our entire nervous system and our entire cerebrospinal fluid, which is like the you know, the fluid that surrounds our whole nervous system gets flooded with these emotional molecules. And so it's impossible to have an emotion that doesn't affect us physio physiologically. Um, we know this, we get embarrassed, our cheeks flush, right? It is happening with all of our emotions all of the time. Um, so that one's a little harder, but you know, you have too much force, the force has got to go somewhere. We get injuries, okay? This also includes repetitive stress injuries. So over time, you're just wearing something down by using it incorrectly for a really, really long time without balancing it out. That is still manual uh, wear and tear. I do want to take a second to talk about birth here because Birth is a really interesting one. We talked about that baby being born so perfect, right? Um, that's the best example that we see in nature. But babies can be subluxated too. Birth is traumatic, especially with interventions and depending on, you know, what their mother has had to adapt to in her life um, as she's giving birth. So birth, whether it is by you know, natural birth or whether it is a cesarean birth, they both have their different forces and traumas and babies can be subluxated from birth alone, okay? Toxins. So toxins, we think about what are you eating? What are you putting into the system? What are you breathing in? What are you putting on your skin? What are you absorbing, right? These are the materials that our body has to deal with. And the more things that our body has to deal with, the less resources it has to just continue to maintain its normal functions, right? You give somebody, you know, say you have a job and your job is to just do, to sweep and keep a, you know, a mail room clean, say. I'm imagining, you know, white envelopes and papers everywhere, and your job is to just keep cleaning the floor. So, I mean, now say that you have to also, you know, do lick all the envelopes, and then you also have to go up to the third floor to collect certain mail because their mail chute isn't working. And then, oh, do you also mind doing this? Well, every time that you're away doing something else, that floor is getting dirty, right? So toxins can be something that really overload our system. Not to mention if you're not eating enough of good stuff, 
then your body doesn't have the building blocks to even do the mail room. So your broom is made of a toothpick and some, you know, mouse hair instead of what it should be made of, which is, you know, a wooden handle and some nice uh, straw bristles or whatever. That's a crazy example, but I'm just saying, we need our resources to do the job. And then the more jobs we have, the harder it is to do the job as well. Okay, and thoughts. This one is huge in my practice. A lot of people would never guess that a chiropractor or their doctor would ever care about what kind of thoughts are going on in their head unless it's a you know psychiatrist or some sort of counselor. However, from the very origins of chiropractic, it has been known that thoughts are overwhelming to the system. And the close tie between the mind and body and the close tie between our thoughts and the way that our body manifests what we perceive is going on. So experiences are processed in your brain. You cannot look at something and actually see it. Um, that all takes place in your brain. Adding what it is the context of what it is, what it means, all of those subtleties, that also takes place in your brain, okay? So this is all our nervous system handling this. We perceive the world around us with our nervous system. So self-talk, what is going on in that head of yours? How much worry and anxiety and stress do you have? Um, and then how are you perceiving the world around you? What have your previous experiences led you to believe about what is happening in your day-to-day -day life? Okay, so I have touched on this. I've almost given it away in every single T that I've talked about, but what do they have in common? Okay, what are, what are thoughts, toxins, and traumas gonna do to your system? Overall, stress. They are going to cause stress on the system. We're all familiar with stress, aren't we? <laughs> I bet. It is so common. So stress is not necessarily the event or stimulus that happens in life. So it's not actually the actual thought, the actual toxin, or the actual trauma, but it is your brain's judgment that what is happening exceeds your resources. So like we talked about in subluxation in the beginning, you are unable to adapt to whatever just happened and you gotta do something with that energy, right? So that can mean time constraints, emotional capacity, your coping ability, it can also be your physical limitations, how strong are your joints, how strong are your muscles, how, uh, how you know, ready to fight is your immune system. When the brain feels that it is under stress, physiological changes take place. That means our body has a physical reaction. It's not just in our head. And sometimes that can mean creating pain out of nowhere. And sometimes it means activating pain pathways from things that hurt us in the past. So that's just one example of what can happen when we're under a lot of stress. We also talked earlier when we talked about the subluxation of a tension pattern that, that takes place. That whole thing will, will activate. So many people will say, oh, I carry my tension in my shoulders, or, you know, I really just clench my jaw when I'm stressed. We know that tension arises when we're having stress. So the nervous system physio physiology basics. All right, some things you must know about the nervous system in order to <laughs> understand the effect of stress on the human body. So we have an autonomic nervous system, which is the part that does all the stuff that we don't have to think about. So 
if I want to raise my hand, yeah, if everybody wants to, you know, raise their hand just to get a little bit of movement in, feel free. You have a thought, I'd like to raise my arm now, and wha-bam, you do it, right? All of the muscles that needed to activate in order for that to happen, they just do it because you thought it and you made it happen. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the autonomic nervous system, which is if you said, okay, I'd like to send some more blood to my big toe now, it might be a little bit harder to do. <laughs> some people have mastered that, you know, some monks have been able to master heating their own bodies with just their the power of their mind. Um, but you know, if we want to talk about, okay, well, I'm going to sleep now. So I hope I don't stop breathing in the night. You know, we have a certain amount of faith that we are going to continue functioning even when our mind is turned off. And all of those things are autonomic nervous system takes care of. Okay. So our autonomic nervous system, so the, all the automatic stuff is then further divided into parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Our parasympathetic is the rest and digest. Let's just relax, take a break, sit in the hammock. Um, this is what I think of, you know, you just had Thanksgiving dinner and now you're just sleepy and digesting and you need to maybe unbutton that top button of your pants and ah, take a nice deep breath. Maybe you, you kind of fall into a little bit of a sleep. Our sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight nervous system. So when you are on the road and a car comes out right in front of you and you react very quickly, you slam the brakes, sweat shoots out your armpits, your heart rate starts racing, you're, you know, whoa, what was that? That is sympathetic nervous system, okay? That is us ready to react. We got a boost of our adrenaline, we are like ramped up. So there's all these, this image shows all of the different things that happen uh, physi physically in our bodies when we're, our nervous system is in that. And it's supposed to be a pendulum. We're supposed to swing from parasympathetic. We're mostly in parasympathetic and then we swing to sympathetic if we need to and then we go back into more of a parasympathetic stage. It's supposed to be a pendulum, okay? Another thing you need to know we talked about the anatomy where the spinal cord is inside the vertebra. And the vertebra are, we know that po people have bad posture. We forward lean, we, we, we sit on our, uh, you know, on our desk, we're looking at our phones. And this is actually causing something called spinal cord tension. Our spinal cord is tethered at the top, at the base of our skull. And at the bottom, at our coccyx, actually, with a phylum terminale, a thick fiber that is tethering it to both ends. So when we pull it forward, we're actually stretching it. And what that does is changes the tune of it. If you think about how guitar strings work or any sort of string instrument, the tighter you tune it, you get a different sound, right? So it's the same thing with our spinal cord. Our tone gets completely changed if we have altered spinal cord tension or altered posture. This also changes blood flow, okay? Everything in our spinal cord is nerve tissue, right? All of that nerve tissue in order to be healthy, to be viable, needs to be bathing in some nice blood, cerebral spinal fluid and just full of nutrients and oxygen and all of the good stuff that comes in blood. And when it's ramped up or twisted in a tension pattern, that's like having a towel that's sitting in some in a in a sink and you just take it and wring it out. 
Okay, we know that that towel can't absorb as much water when we have tension on it. It simply doesn't absorb as much water. That's how you get water out of a towel is by adding tension. So if we just let the tension relax, it soaks up all that goody goody. All right, and actually we are change, physically changing the shape of those receptors. Remember earlier I talked about how there are receptors for all of the molecules of our emotions all over our spinal cord. Yeah, those change, those have a special shape like a lock and key. So the molecule goes straight in to the, the key. The key fits straight into the lock and that's how you get a reaction. If you have the lock changing shape due to spinal cord tension, the key goes in and it doesn't always fit. So we don't get as many of our emotions felt. And those molecules build up with nowhere to go, nothing to attach to. And that can cause emotional problems and other things. All right, the third thing you need to understand about the nervous system is that it works in patterns. So we learn by doing, and there's this kind of like use it or lose it system in our neurology where the more we use a pathway, the stronger it becomes. So if I'm constantly playing, you know, that's how we can get really good at sports. If I'm playing tennis and I just do it over and over and over and over again, my brain, all of the different nerve pathways that are required to hit that ball just the way I want to, um, they all get stronger. And in the meantime, less energy is being put on other skills. Who knows what they are, right? So if you are constantly sitting in a crummy, crumpled posture, um, you're reiterating that. If you constantly have a thought of negative self-talk and that you're, you know, you're worthless and why are you here, that becomes the pattern that is um, that is used. And this is not to say that this is a bad design. This is a great design. If you think about it in, you know, in sports and habit forming and things that are all positive, that is a great system. It's just when it gets out of hand and it doesn't adapt properly to the situation at hand, then that's when we run into trouble and we could use some repatterning. Okay, right. So this is, I'm always getting out of myself. <laughs> I thought this was an intelligent system. Okay, so the system is smart, but the times have changed. This system allows us to adapt. It allows us to survive the moment, okay? We, as human beings, were developed in a time, we evolved in a time when we had a very inherent bodily danger, you know, regularly. Think about it. If you were, do you ever watch Naked and Afraid, this TV show? It's so entertaining to me because it takes people from you know normal life. They're they're pretty good at survival. They have um, survivalist skills, but they just have to go be put in an environment with one other person, and they're completely naked, and they. <clears throat> I think they get like one survival tool each, which is even more than you would get, you know, in the in real life as a native person. And they have to survive for 21 days in whatever environment they've been placed. And it's amazing how vulnerable humans are to everything when we don't even have clothes. Like all these people are getting bitten alive by bugs and insects and all of these people are, you know, trying to find clean water sources and just all this stuff. We had inherent danger, man. There was a reason that we needed some adrenaline every now and again, right? There was predators in the world. So our stress response really allowed us to survive those moments. It was a great system of prioritizing, hey, you know what might not be a great idea right now? sending blood to the stomach so that we can digest our food when there's a tiger chasing us. We probably should send that blood to the legs right about now. That would be great so you can run away, right? 
So it was a good system. The thing is, today we live in a place where they're not just a moment long. We don't just escape the tiger and then we're like, whew, okay, cool. We live in chronic states of stress. Chronic, meaning all of the time. We never get a break from it. It's on our, excuse me, it's on our phones. Right? There's a threshold when it becomes too much. We are not meant to be in chronic fight or flight. We're meant to be a pendulum, swinging back to what I said earlier. Okay. So how does that make people sick? Dis-ease. Stagnation, tension, and fixation. We have a pat. We start with the subluxation, a thought, a trauma, a toxin that we don't adapt to properly right away. And then we make a pattern of that because we never deal with it. We never go back and try to address it. And we just keep making a pattern of that. And our system is under a ton of stress, way more than we ever were designed to handle. It is not normal to have five out of 10, six out of 10, seven out of 10 stress. It is not normal to have any chronic stress. <laughs> um, so as a society, we're stressed. This means that our nervous systems are already in that pattern. They're already not going into our parasympathetic, which is where most of our healing and all of those good autonomic functions like rest and digest, where we get good sleep, where we get, you know, we can pull all the nutrients out of the meals we're eating. Not to mention all the toxins <laughs> of that we're doing. And then we're not doing anything to disrupt this pattern. We're not doing anything to change the flow. We're not doing anything to ease that tension pattern or undo it or unwind it. And we're getting stuck, stuck in fixation, stuck in the same old results and the same old thinking and stuck physically. This is when you find places in your spine that do not move. They're stuck, right? Okay, so take, I want you to take a little moment because I gave you a lot of information. And this next section is how does this even apply to you and what can you do about it? So this is something I love, this tool, the wellness spectrum. And it has been agreed upon by, you know, basically everyone in healthcare that this is how it goes. I want you to see that at neutral, there in the middle with the fleur de lis, the fancy one, no discernible illness or wellness. How many of you are here where you are not sick? But I don't know if you'd say you're super well, you know. Um, this is where Americans and most societies would think is normal. And they don't go much past this because compared to other people, they are doing just fine. They're great. No problems. I hear so many people talk to me about Oh, you know, lucky for me, I haven't had to see a chiropractor yet. And this goes back to that early misconception of you have to have something wrong with you in order to see a chiropractor. But it's like, oh, great. There's nothing terribly wrong with you. That's awesome. But what's going, what else? What else is there? What could be going better? What could be going right? And I did not coin this term, so I don't want to steal it by any means, but I heard it and I just love it, which is called the unwellness gap. I think it is a trademarked term, not by me. <laughs> um, but it's like when you're not sick, but you're not quite well, where are you? You're at 50% here. If this is zero and this is 100, 50%. That's failing in the eyes of you know, 
every other grading scale ever, except for when you're grading on a curve and everybody else is at 50%, then you pass with a 50, okay? Life is not the curve. Are you gonna be satisfied with just being better than the curve? Or are you gonna to wanna to be optimal? So when we have signs, symptoms, disability, premature death, where do you wanna be when you start to get old? Where do you wanna be on this scale when things are inevitably starting to decrease? I'd say if you're up here, you have a farther way to go down a better quality of life later, later in life, right? So it's important not to mention what, what potential lies in here. What potential lies here? Are we gonna be okay with just not being sick? That's what our healthcare system currently is really focused on. It's actually a sick care system. You go to the doctor when you feel sick and they give you something to help you not feel sick. They are doing much less on how to prevent you from getting sick in the first place, right? How to keep you healthy, how to help you move past the challenges that inevitably lead to an overload and move into move past that and move into something even greater, right? So where are you on this scale? So your next question is, well, how can we shift our systems? What can we do? This seems pretty bleak <laughs> for many. So one, decreasing stressors, thoughts, traumas, and toxins. You have to become aware, right? The reason everybody says you need to eat well, you need to eat less processed foods, don't, you know, don't smoke cigarettes, don't drink too much alcohol, don't eat too much sugar and candy and crap, is because those are overloading your system. Like we said earlier in the mail room, when you have too many jobs for your body to do, it's not gonna do any of them well. It's gonna focus on your basic needs of survival. Is that what you wanna be doing? Is this surviving? Or do you wanna be thriving? What's it worth to you? Um, proper movement, biomechanics, avoiding that stagnation. We need to get rid of those tension patterns and not let them become solid patterns in our body that are really hard to break up sooner we address things before they form into solid patterns and lead to fixation and dysfunction and all of that stuff, the less of a problem they become, the less stressful they are on our bodies. Positive thoughts, positive thinking, meditation, mantras. Get rid of those nasty voices in your head that are telling you negative things. If you have anxiety, work on it. Um, don't accept it as a normal. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Then by increasing resilience. So there's been a lot of studies on resilience, which is, you know, that original question that uh, Dee Dee Palmer asked all those years ago was why are some people more resilient than others? Um, because they understand what's happening. They are able to comprehend it. It feels manageable to them. They have a plan. They are moving forward. And it's, there's meaningfulness in whatever has happened. They, they know that, you know, whatever it is, maybe this is leading them on the path that they need to, to be on and that they can learn something from it or they find some way to have meaning in whatever it is that's happened to them. Okay, so those are all things that you can practice. And then increasing your nervous system pliability by doing all kinds of things, but basically, you know, making yourself do different things, checking the way that you perceive something, questioning yourself, um, making yourself try different sports and activities. If you only ever play tennis, maybe go for a hike, maybe, um, 
try basketball, you know, do something else, confuse the system, make it do something different, right? Okay, chiropractic does all of that. So chiropractic is the foundation for health. And chiropractic helps your nervous system, helps the body function how it's meant to, and reset those old perceptions and patterns. Um, it reduces that interference, that physical interference. It, um, we look at those tension patterns and how to unwind them so that they don't become, you know, systemic patterns that lead to that dysfunction and fixation in your life. Um, and we form new pathways. We keep your mind busy. We keep your brain doing different things. We find out what goals you want to reach and we help you reach them the more you use it, the stronger it becomes, right? Um, so when we're adjusting you, we're making your nerves fire in a different way and helping rebalance out all of that patterning that you've got going on. Okay. So, so much info. I hope that wasn't too much info. But one thing I wanna talk about as my job as a chiropractor, I feel like it's my job to empower you, to teach you about all of the amazing things that your body does for you every single day, automatically, without you ever thinking about it, to teach you that you are inherently and innately healthy and that health is the natural state of the body and that anything that is hampering that health has just been interference that we just need to remove. It's nothing extra, just no interference. And then trying to exemplify what it looks like to live a chiropractic lifestyle by not only the way that I live, but by the way I practice at Eudaimonia. Eudaimonia means human flourishing. It's about being more than just normal, being optimal and actually thriving and being the most we can be. My, you know, it's really common for our old patterning to want to hold us back into what we think is safe and what has been keeping us going and surviving each moment for the time being. Doing something different is scary to us because our bodies and our minds don't like unknowns because there could be inherent danger there. But I promise you that stepping out of your comfort zone and trying something new might be exactly what you need to promote your best health. I know how hard it can be to break up that pattern. And I know all the voices in your head might be trying to come up with excuses of why you shouldn't embark on this and why it's okay where you are and why you shouldn't try to be um, 100%. 50% is okay. And I really urge you to let yourself grow and expand and be more than you thought you could become. Uh, chiropractors are catalysts, and this is another big word, but I just can't think of another word that's better. You can do a lot to serve your nervous system and your health without coming to see a chiropractor. You know, like we talked about meditation, um, talking about, you know, watching your diet and nutrition, getting movement and trying different things. You can work on your resilience by comprehensibility, understanding what's happening, finding the positive in that, creating meaningfulness, and coming up with a plan yourself. But chiropractors are here to facilitate that journey for you and to help guide that energy and guide you forward. So a reaction takes place when, you know, two molecules come together and create a chemical reaction. And that can happen randomly. Two molecules can just be floating around and hopefully eventually they glom together and, you know, a reaction occurs. When you have a catalyst, a catalyst is an enzyme that is specifically designed to take this molecule and this molecule and put them together. And that way they can efficiently cause change. That's what I feel my job is, is to 
facilitator, as a catalyst, and your chiropractor. So if your body hasn't healed itself yet, how long have you been dealing with that old injury or that old tension pattern or that old adaptation? If it's taken 20 years already, I'm guessing that six months of your time, a year of your time is pretty worth it for you in the long run. So I highly recommend seeking professional help to guide you through those health challenges and to prevent any of the dysfunction, dis-ease, or fixations that can occur from leaving these problems unaddressed. Your intelligence system just needs a little bit of guidance. And that is what chiropractors are here for. I hope you learned something today. You can always contact me for questions. Um, it's a pleasure to share. And I hope that you all have a fabulous, fabulous day. Here's to your flourishing. Take care.